Imagine a society where all of the decisions are made around tables like this, mostly by men, behind closed doors. There's no transparency, no democratic participation. That society still exists today. And I'm not talking about China or Saudi Arabia. I'm talking about the big tech companies of Silicon Valley and the communications platforms that they run. These companies have unprecedented control over what we can say and what we can see. And the decisions made on closed campuses affect the entire world. These decisions made online can have real-world impact. Let's take Facebook, for example. Today, with 2.23 billion daily active users, Facebook has almost 1 billion more people using it than China has citizens. Now, of course, these companies are not governments. They don't have military strength behind them. That's an important thing to note. But they do have power over the public sphere, the way that we think of it, in ways that we've never seen before. Ten years ago, I had just returned from living abroad in Morocco for a few years and was back in my home country, the US. I was working at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. There I was studying government internet censorship, which is a really fascinating topic to me, looking at the ways that governments restrict access to websites, access to information, and freedom of expression. One day I got an email from a young man in Morocco. Now, we'd never met before, but he was connected to the same network of activists and bloggers that I had known during my time there. And he wasn't writing to me about government internet censorship, although that certainly did and does exist in that country. Rather, he was telling me about something that I'd never heard of before. His Facebook page had been taken down, and he'd been given a message quite like this one that explained that he'd violated the Statement of Rights and Responsibilities, today known as the Community Standards. And those, those rules restrict you from posting certain types of content, such as nude imagery or incitement to violence hate speech, and many other things. But it wasn't nude photos, and it wasn't incitement to violence that he had posted. His page was advocating for secularism in the Kingdom of Morocco. Now, this is something that the government's not really a big fan of. But in this case, it wasn't the government, at least as far as we know, that had gotten the page taken down. It was actually Facebook itself, and the people who make the policies, and the people who moderate the content on that platform, that had decided for some reason that that page should go down. And in the message that he received, it said that this decision is final and cannot be appealed. Now, I've been sharing this story and many others like it for nearly a decade, and I often hear the same kinds of responses. Here's my favorite one. These are private companies. They can do whatever they want. Okay, so legally speaking, these are private companies. And most of them are based in the US, where you would think free speech, right? The First Amendment. Well, the way that the law works is that we have this thing called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. It was put into place in the mid-90s. And it says that companies are protected from liability for the things that people post on their platforms. Largely a good thing. But on the other side, it also gives companies the right to regulate speech and content as they see fit, which means that if they don't like cats, they can ban cat photos. In reality, it means that they ban things like terrorism and hate speech, but also things like sexual health information and nudity. So I think that we're selling ourselves short by accepting these excuses. I think that by thinking inside of this legal framework only, we're missing a whole lot of other opportunities. And this issue doesn't just affect Moroccan secularists, it affects all different kinds of people from all different countries and all different walks of life. Here's one example. So in the US, the national campaign against teen and unplanned pregnancy had an advertisement that they were trying to put on different social networks. And it was aimed at getting young people to use condoms. I think we're mostly in favor of that. Um, and this advertisement was telling young people that sex can still be good with a condom. Great, great information. Um, unfortunately, uh, Twitter deemed that to be too sexy 
for their platform, and they banned them. Now, marijuana, controversial subject in some places, but across Canada and in many states of the U.S., it's now legal. However, the dispensaries that sell it can't advertise on any of these platforms in the same way that a pharmacy or a florist can. And then, of course, you've got these political examples that keep cropping up in the media. Facebook has banned Black Lives Matter activists, typically because they've posted hate speech that they've actually received on these platforms and then get taken down out of context for reposting that kind of message. We've seen the LGBT community censored on YouTube. Um, in this case, it may have even been an accident made by an algorithm. And then, of course, some of these more serious, harsh examples, such as the Syrian activist who posts videos of atrocities happening in her home country only to find that it violates YouTube's graphic violence policy. There's a growing consciousness around these issues, and there's been a lot more reporting about it in the past few years, and for that I'm very grateful. The Guardian has uh, pu published the Facebook files last year that gave us insight into the way that Facebook in particular governs speech and creates policies. We've seen reporting from Motherboard and the New York Times, a number of different publications, in Germany as well. But consciousness isn't enough. We need to do something as well. And so what I believe is that we need to apply human rights frameworks to platform governance. And it's not just me who thinks this. My organization is on board as well, but so is the UN and the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, who wrote a, very pa a paper about this very topic last year. And so that's why earlier this year, a group of us came together to create a set of principles called the Santa Clara Principles, named after the place where we wrote them, on transparency and accountability in content moderation. And this goes over three key principles that I'm going to share with you right now. The first is transparency. This is really basic, but companies aren't doing it. They don't tell us who makes the policies. They don't tell us how the policies are made and how they're implemented. We don't even know, except through investigative reporting, who's you know, clicking on the buttons that actually take the content down or leave it up. And so transparency, we need that. The second is communication. Now, this goes along with transparency as well. We want companies to communicate to users when they did something wrong, what they did wrong, and what they can do to rectify it. Which brings me to my third point. You might remember from the earlier slide the story that I told about the young man from Morocco. He was told that, in his case, the decision was final and could not be appealed. Now, we've seen some progress in that area, but in most cases, people still can't appeal the decisions that are made incorrectly. And so we want to see due process. Now, these principles are important, and there's a number of groups and organizations that are using them to push companies harder toward applying human rights frameworks to their platforms. But there's more that we can do, because we get the most done when we work together to raise awareness. These companies know that every user counts, and historically, we've seen what happens when people actually do come together to push back. This is one of my favorite examples. About four years ago, a group of drag performers in San Francisco found that they had violated Facebook's real names policy because they were using their performance names on the platform. They fought back. They actually protested in front of Facebook's Menlo Park headquarters until they got the company to change their policy. Now, it was a small victory. It's, we're not there yet, but it was a good and important one for many people. Similarly, Breastfeeding mothers have pushed back against these companies as well for banning them from sharing photos, even with their friends. Um, and in that case, another one, Facebook clarified its nudity policy and said that, in fact, breastfeeding photos would be allowed going forward. And these are small victories, and our work is only beginning. But these companies are no longer merely platforms. In some cases, they own the very fiber through which our communications flow. And Facebook, again, to bring it back to my favorite example, Facebook's free basics program, which is a free version of the platform, includes some other uh, apps to go alongside it. This has been launched in several countries, such as Myanmar and Thailand. And in, some, in these places, as a result, users are disincentivized from looking outside of the platforms for information. In effect, Facebook becomes the internet. For some people, these platforms will always be a fun place to share vacation photos and debate about politics. But for many people, they're a vital way of connecting across borders, participating in social movements, 
and sharing personal stories. And when people are prevented from having their voices heard, the consequences can be huge. So we need to recognize the power that these companies now have, and we need to start treating these companies like the corporate governments that they are. Thank you.